what matters more to you? Winning or getting across the line? I want to tell you about an alternative way of winning. An alternative way of being. Finding a way to win and finding a way to get across the line. Facing adversity with a grin. This is my story. When I was three years old, I was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. The educational psychologist said to my wonderful mother, Gifty, who I refer to as Gif, your son has a hybrid of autism called global development delay and Asperger's syndrome. He's partially deaf in one ear. You're going to have to teach him to sign. Now, marathon is going to come up a lot in this talk because it's a really easy metaphor to use. And in terms of endurance, this was my mum's first test of endurance. She could have felt, I guess, she was dealt a bad hand. Two boys, 13 months apart, my brother Joseph and myself, both autistic. It's tough times. But she embraced it. And that was the thing about Gif. She was wonderful. She was amazing. She'd always say to me, Jason, you are unique. You are a wonderful human being, and you will do great things. And that's the thing with repetition. You hear it over and over again, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You begin to believe that. So, for seven years, three times a week, we would go to speech therapy classes, doing the same speech therapy exercises and algorithms over and over and over again. There wasn't anything to suggest that things were improving, not one iota. But then, something happens. And this comes off the back of educational psychologists and their perceived wisdom. One being, your son is going to struggle to survive in the real world. He's going to struggle to survive as an adult or a child in the real world. He will need as much support as possible. During this period of seven years where we're doing these phonic exercises, you do the same things over and over and over again. And I love repetition. I'm autistic. I really do love repetition. Very often, I'm telling the same stories as I've told them the first time. And everyone's always looking at me as if to say, I haven't got the heart to tell him. <laughs> I haven't got the heart to tell him. He's told that story about 50 times. But on this particular day, it was a really special moment. It was a really seminal one. Everyone's backs were turned to in the room. So they weren't facing me. I'm in the room practicing these exercises. I take my hearing aid out of my ear. And at the age of 11, I say my first word. Hello. My mum stands and she says, Jason, do it again. Say it again. In disbelief. And so I say again, hello. It was a huge, powerful moment. And the reason why this moment resonates so much is because it was the first time I realised that despite me having unfavourable odds, potentially, if I worked hard and persevered at something, I could convert the most unfavourable odds into my favour. So roll on what was a helter-skelter, adolescence, into teenagehood, and I become an adult. I'm 18 years of age, um, except I've just learned to read and write, so in many respects, I've got the keys to the world, albeit with the reading age of an eight-year-old, but we're cooking with gas. It's, it's at least we're doing something. Step into the fray. Sandro, Andre, Sandri. An eccentric Brazilian-Italian from Cordichiba. He turns around to me and he says, Jason, what do you want to do with your life? I humbly reply, I'd like to work in a supermarket so I can support my family and friends. He says, Jason, you can dream bigger than that. 
I think we could get to university in two years. We could take on the world and win. I look at him again and I laugh. And he says to me, what are you laughing at? And I said, well, with my modest capabilities, there's no way I can get to university. By this point, I've learned a thesaurus. I've got a thesaurus, so I'm starting to use words now. I'm putting sense together. It's great. And there's always that one person for all of us that brings us on a journey. They allow us to believe. They allow us to think outside of our own capabilities and dream beyond measure. And that was the beautiful thing about Sandra. So we get to university two years later, as he professed. Fantastic. Great. However, I get there, and I'm completely out of my depth. I'm struggling. I really want to quit because I've gone to university effectively with the reading age of a 12-year-old, and I'm doing degree-level work. But something really salient happens. I find out at 21, I'm going to become a dad. And that particular moment paralyzes me with fear. Completely paralyzes me with fear. And so I accept this as a situation, and it gives me a reason to persevere. The actual thing that becomes the iconic image in my own mind is having Taylor in my arms for the first time. In fact, she was in my hand. She was in my hand. And I remember looking at her and thinking, I'm going to give it everything I've got. Everything I've got. And so we did. Got to 23. We graduated. We managed to do it. Sandra and I took on the world. 2-0 to Sandro and Jason. Rest of the world, zero. And again, it comes back to that person that inspires you to believe you can be better than you can. But that's the thing with success. It's a drug. It's a drug. It's an endorphin. And so when I thought of different alternative paths, my madness led me towards a PhD. Now, a PhD, just to be clear, it's not a test of intelligence. It's a test of endurance. I knew I wasn't intelligent. I knew that. But what I did know is that I was willing to work harder than anyone else because it had been ingrained in me. From this high to meeting Sandra as an adult, it was ingrained. It was part of my psyche. It was part of my fiber. And so we go on to this PhD. In January 2015, I hit a significant roadblock. It was a huge one. I was diagnosed with a brain tumor, which at the time was life-threatening. I didn't tell anyone around me, and I kept it to myself. Interestingly, experiencing that, you kind of are able to put into perspective what is important and what isn't important. And so I went back to what my original mission was. Taylor, in my hand, and we all have that person that you do just about absolutely anything for. And I thought, I'm going to give it everything I've got. And so we have the brain surgery. And the brain surgery is three weeks before my PhD exam. I go in there. I don't remember a thing. <laughs> I don't remember anything. And because, actually, once I had my surgery, what's common with having um, endoscopies and having brain tumors removed is that you end up suffering strokes. And so I'd had a stroke. And so I'd completely forgotten everything that I was supposed to know. I'm sat in this exam, and I'm failing. I'm failing miserably. I'm paralyzed by the same fear that gripped me, that absolutely strangulated me at 21 years of age when I thought I was going to be a dad. But we all have that resource bank that we can go into, and it's, you can withdraw out of it any time you like. All of those life experiences allow you to be able to take money out at any time you like and spend it in any way you want. So I chose, at this particular time, whilst I was failing miserably, to draw every single cent I had in that bank. Something happens. I think back to myself as an 11-year-old, learning to speak for the first time. I think back 
to my 18 year old self. Learning to read and write for the first time. And then I think of my 20 year old self getting to university. And it all comes together. I couldn't tell you how. I don't know how we did it, but we did it. We took on the world and we won. All of you have somehow, in some way, taken on the world and won. And on this particular day, I won the day. Sandra and I had won the day. Three hours later, they turn around and say, congratulations, Dr. Jason Arde. It was surreal. Navigating difficulty is a deeply personal thing as you'll see me in a blubbering rest at a minute trying to do. It's deeply personal. We all navigate difficulty and have our own marathons to run, and we'll all hit the proverbial wall in different ways. Humility is so important in terms of having the courage to face challenges, accepting that we can't always win. We can't always be the best at something. It's about trying your best. The courage to step foot into the arena and to try, to give it a go, to fare where other people may not dare tread. And the fearlessness to keep finding a way to keep going. That is living. Our ability to exist to thrive, to overcome, to achieve, is based on these three tenets. As I've said, it's a deeply personal thing. You will all have ways of navigating difficulty. But what I would always try and encourage is enjoy it. Enjoy it. It's a privilege to be in a situation where you're able to embrace pressure. It's a privilege to be in a situation where you have the opportunity to even have pressure in the same room. I love music. It's the central tenet to everything I am. And in particular, I think the greatest front person of all time is Freddie Mercury. And in the song, The Show Must Go On, Freddie Mercury says, and all of you will know his story, he speaks about this idea of he'll never give in. And so my message to you, as the great Freddie Mercury would say, is face life with a grin. And above all, never give in. Thank you. <laughs>